Well, many people might not know it, but the word Armageddon is a biblical term. It has been used in the titles of movies and books over the years and is always associated with war and destruction and the end of the world. This, in fact, is true. But as we aim to show you tonight, Armageddon, or the Day of the Lord, is not an end in itself. It is a means to an end. That end being the present arrangement of the world and the beginning of the establishment of God's worldwide kingdom with the Lord Jesus Christ peacefully reigning as the king. We aim to show you tonight what Armageddon is and that there is a, there is a means of escaping its destruction. I hope of finding a place in God's glorious kingdom which we pray will be shortly set up on the earth with the Lord Jesus Christ as King. Come with me to Revelation 16 where we find the only occurrence of the word Armageddon in the Bible. Revelation 16 and reading verses 14 to 18. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices, and thunders, and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake, and so great. So yes, as it says here, Armageddon is a time of great warfare. But ladies and gentlemen, the world needs Armageddon. It needs Armageddon like it needs nothing else. Because this is the event associated with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth that will precede a time of peace and joy that the world has never known. Thanks. Consider the paradoxical state of the world we live in today. There is plenty of food for all, yet millions starve. There is abounding wealth, yet whole nations are desperately poor. There are unprecedented numbers of refugees, but nowhere for them to go. Medical science is extending life, yet millions drug themselves stupid or take their lives in suicide or waste away into nothing from social diseases like AIDS. Marvellous things are invented and trade increases enormously, yet millions of people cannot find work to support themselves or their families. Every conceivable home luxury and neighbouring saving device is made, yet families fight, parents break up and children leave home. Ladies and gentlemen, what is this world coming to? It can't keep going the way it is. The world is on a collision course for self-destruction. But, However, the Bible tells us that God will intervene, and tonight, God willing, we'll see just how he will do this. So what does the word Armageddon mean? You'll notice in verse 16 of Revelation 16, it says, And he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Obviously, Armageddon is a place where an event will occur. Now, the event, word Armageddon, according to the Hebrew experts, can be broken up into three words. These are um, arima, which means a heap of sheaves, gai, which means a valley, dun, which means judgment. Now, when you put the sum of these three words together, the definition comes to a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. Okay, so with this knowledge and that definition there in front of us, let's have another look at Revelation 16, and we'll read again verses 14 and 16. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So these two verses appear to be saying fairly much the same thing. And from this passage it can be seen that God, working through the evil spirit of world leaders, draws the nations together for the purpose of executing his judgments on them. Now the question that immediately springs to mind is, why would a book of the New Testament, originally written in Greek, tell us that in order to find something important out, we must look at the Hebrew language? 
The short answer is that we need to realise that Armageddon will focus world attention onto Israel and that it involves God's people and God's land. It refers us back to the Hebrew prophets in the Old Testament where this time of judgment and conflict is often associated with the idea of threshing, which when we consider these we will come to the realisation that the Bible tells us that Armageddon is indeed a future event and that it is the great day of God Almighty referred to in Revelation. So let's go to the Old Testament. Come to Zephaniah, first of all, come to Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 8. We read in Zephaniah 3 and verse 8, Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. These words should sound familiar, didn't we? Just read similar words in Revelation 16 and verse 14 and 16. And what is really amazing about this verse is it's the only sentence in the Bible that contains all the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, not just a coincidence. Clearly the Hebrew that this passage is written in is telling us about Armageddon. Let's look at the similarities. We'll compare Zephaniah 3 and Revelation 16. Gather the nations in Zephaniah 3. Assemble the kingdoms, paralleled in Revelation 16. Kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them. Pour upon them mine indignation, says Zephaniah, even all my fierce anger, and in Revelation, to the battle of that great day of God Almighty, and devoured with the fire of my jealousy in Zephaniah. In Revelation, a heap of sheaves, the definition of Armageddon, a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. Let us look at some more ways in which the Hebrew prophets speak of the great coming great day of God Almighty. Daniel 2 and at verse 35. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Micah 4, verses 12 and 13. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel. For he shall gather them as the sheaves into the floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thy horn iron, and I will make thy hooves brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people. And I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. And finally, Joel 3. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get ye down, for the press is full, the fats, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The immediately noticeable thing about these verses is that they all use the metaphors as so threshing. For example, the harvest is ripe, gathering of the nations as sheaves, Arise and thresh, summer threshing floors. So you see, this definition of the word Armageddon is consistent. Other passages you might like to consider in your own time, which use similar symbology, are Habakkuk chapter 3 and Isaiah's chapter, Isaiah chapters 41 and 63. And the book of Revelation further takes up this symbology, if you like, in chapter 14. Revelation is speaking of a time when the Lord Jesus Christ will bring about God's judgments on the earth. And we'll read Revelation 14, verses 14 to 16. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap! For the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. From these few extracts we can see that the Bible is showing that the great day of God Almighty involves the gathering of the nations to, of the world together. And this will be when, in God's plan, both the time 
and the harvest is ripe, when the time will have arrived for threshing and judgment. So what is a simple way of describing this event? Using one descriptive, symbolic Hebrew word that, cons- that is consistent with what the, pre- the Hebrew prophets have told us and which adequately describes this event can only be one word, Armageddon. And what about the valley component of the definition of Armageddon, this valley for judgment? How does that fit into the picture? We'll come to our reading for tonight, to Joel chapter 3. We've already seen from the prophet Joel that this event of God's judgment takes place in a valley. Consider our reading for tonight, Joel 3, and we'll read verses 12 to 14 again. Let the heathen be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get your the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. To understand more about what the prophet Joel is saying, we need to find out a bit more about Jehoshaphat. Keep a finger there in Joel 3 and come with me across to back in back in the Old Testament to 2nd of Chronicles chapter 20. Jehoshaphat was a king of Judah in ancient times and we're introduced to him in verse 1 of 2nd of Chronicles 20 as being in a battle. The vital point to remember from this chapter is that God, it was God that defeated Judah's enemies for them, as we can read about in verse 22, Second Chronicles 20 and verse 22. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. Now God brought a blessing upon the people of, by bringing his judgments on those enemies of Judah that were invading their land at the time. And as a result, the valley where God's judgments took place upon these invading nations became known as Berakar. And we see that from verse 26. And on the fourth day they assembled themselves in the valley of Berakar, for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore the name of the same place was called the valley of Berakar, unto this day. So in the margin of an Oxford King James Version of the Bible, it tells you that the name Berakar means Valley of Blessing. So if you link the prophecies of Joel together with the story of Jehoshaphat, we can see that this story foreshadows an event yet to occur in the future, where yet again God would rescue his people, the Jews, from foreign armies invading the land of Israel by bringing his judgments upon them. And what is significant is that this is exactly what the name Jehoshaphat means, the judgments of God. So when Joel talks about the location of Armageddon being the valley of Jehoshaphat, clearly he does not have in mind the valley of Berakar, but rather a symbolic place of threshing judgments of God. Nowhere does the Bible describe such a valley, and nor does the uh, famous Jewish historian Josephus who lived around the time of Jesus. So back in Joel 3 and verse 14, we notice that the prophet also refers to the place of God's judgment as a valley of decision. So what does this mean? By using a concordance, such as one written by Dr. Strong, we find out that the particular Hebrew word used for decision only occurs 12 times in the Bible. Two of these are in Joel, and and we read them tonight, and they're translated as decision. And the other 10 times the Hebrew word is translated It has the meaning of sharp-edged instruments used for threshing. What a precise link back to the definition of Armageddon. How wonderfully consistent the Bible is. So what about the Hebrew word for valley used in Joel to describe God's threshing judgments upon the nations who invade the land of Israel? Again, by using a Bible concordance, we discover that this word also means a veil or open country. So to paraphrase the prophet Joel in these verses, it is warning us, the readers, of an event where when the time is ripe and the harvest is ready, 
God will bring his threshing judgments to bear in the open space of his threshing floor. So all we have to do now is locate God's threshing floor. Well, which city on this earth is the most controversial? Which city receives the most media attention? Is the centre of the world's three most prominent religions? And more pertinently, which city has as its centre the remains of a temple which is built on a threshing floor? That's right, Jerusalem. Consider Second of Chronicles 3 and verse 1. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, there where the Lord appeared unto David his father, in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan and the Jebusite. Here the first temple was erected by, by wise King Solomon, the son of David, King David, on the, south, on the site of the, a threshing floor. Later, some time after it had been destroyed by the Babylonians, it was rebuilt by a man named Zerubbabel. And then Herod built his temple on the site around the time when Jesus was on the earth. And the remains of this are present today in the form of the Wailing War. Zechariah 14, re-emphasising what we've learned in Revelation 16, tells us how all nations will be drawn to Jerusalem for battle, as it says there in verse 2, for the great day of God Almighty. One thing becomes quite clear. Armageddon is also an event, not just a place. It is the event of God's judgments upon or harvest of the nations, when he will settle his controversy with the nations for being in Israel to do battle, as it says in Jeremiah 25, oh, sorry, 25 verse 31. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He'll give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. And then God will start his long program of judging the world with righteousness, as it says in Acts 17 and verse 31. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Now imagine World War Three today with the world as we know it, with the scale of weaponry and the ability of man to destroy. Armageddon will see Christ intervening and resolving the conflict once and for all, heralding in a new age of peace and security for all. Having seen what and where Armageddon is, and that it involves many nations, there remains a further question. When will Armageddon occur? Well, actually, the simple answer is we don't know. The Bible does not give an answer to this question. What we do know, however, is that God has revealed enough in the Bible, for us in the Bible to do his will in order to be prepared for that battle of Armageddon. And the reason why we don't know when Armageddon will take place is because it involves not just a war between nations, but the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth as we saw earlier from Revelation 14. We've also seen that it is not just another Middle East conflict between Jews and Arabs, but it is, a, as it says in Joel 2 verse 31, the great and terrible day of the Lord. It is the same event that we can read more about at our own leisure in Ezekiel 38, Daniel 11, and Zechariah 12 to 14 and elsewhere. A careful reading of these chapters and the context in which they occur make it clear that they refer to the event described in Revelation 16 as Armageddon, or the time when the nations of the earth will be gathered together as sheaves for threshing in the battle of Armageddon. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is involved, Armageddon after he returns, after the resurrection and subsequent judgment of those responsible through knowledge and baptism. It is only after this that the work of re-establishing God's peaceful kingdom on earth can occur, a work which will commence with the Battle of Armageddon. Briefly then, how do we know that the Lord Jesus Christ will return to the earth? Consider Acts 1 and verse 11 with me. In Acts 1 verse 11 we have an angel speaking to the Lord Jesus Christ's twelve disciples. And he says there, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? 
This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. The important words here being shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Where were they when the Lord Jesus Christ went up into heaven? Verse 12 tells us they were in the region of the mount called Olivet, or the Mount of Olives, outside of Jerusalem. There is no doubt at all that the time is coming when the Lord Jesus Christ will reveal himself to the world from the Mount of Olives. Come to the prophecy of Zechariah 14 to see this made plain for us. Zechariah 14, we'll start at verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Such a wide open space created by this valley will end the confusion created by Christ as part of his battle plan following these events provide the very arena centred on Jerusalem for the judgments of God when the time of threshing and harvest arrives. For the events of Zechariah to take place, the Lord Jesus Christ must already have returned to the earth. So how can we escape Armageddon? Ladies and gentlemen, knowing what Armageddon is and what, is it is, what, is, what it is designed to achieve, rather than being something to dread and fear, it should in fact be an event whose prospect we find comforting, something we should welcome its occurrence on the earth. But given that massive destruction, how can this be so? Well, as we have alluded to this evening, ladies and gentlemen, Armageddon is a series of events that cleanses the earth and sets the stage for the establishment of the kingdom of God here on earth. What we do with this knowledge is absolutely critical to our hope of escaping Armageddon. You see, this knowledge is useless unless it means something to us personally. If we desire eternal life and an inheritance in God's kingdom on earth at the Lord Jesus Christ's coming, it is necessary for us to do something about it. Come with me to Proverbs 18. The Lord Jesus Christ will only reward those who have, ident who have identified themselves with him now. This is, the, this is quite the opposite to the majority of the world today. Let us read Proverbs 18 and verse 10. The name of Yahweh is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Now Yahweh is the covenant name of God given to Israel through his greatest prophet, Moses. That's God's name, and it is so significant that it guarantees the fulfillment of his purpose with that nation. And this includes the events of Armageddon. The preaching of the gospel has a relation to that name of God. The purpose of God in sending forth believers called apostles to teach his name is quite clearly shown in the words of Acts 15 and verse 14. And that is that God did send, visit the Gentiles, that's us, to take out of them a people for his name. What that means is to manifest his characteristics and way of life. It is like a family trait or a set of characteristics. It's taking on God's characteristics or Yahweh's characteristics. So how can we be, how can we be identified with the name of God? A name that guarantees eternity to those who bear it faithfully? The answer is by baptism in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord himself in Mark 16 verses 15 and 16 gave this command to his disciples. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptised 
shall be saved. Come with me to Acts chapter 8. As our speaker last week clearly pointed out, a sound knowledge of the saving gospel makes baptism valid. It is not valid without such an understanding. If we take the example of the Apostle Philip preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8, they come to the, a body of water in verse 36, and the eunuch asks Philip, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptised? And Philip replies in Acts 8, in verse 37, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he, that is the eunuch, answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Note the words, If you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch's confession of his belief came as a result of Philip spending several hours with him preaching to him, Jesus, as we can see in verse 35. The point being that the eunuch's desire to be baptised came about because of his knowledge and understanding of the gospel. Now come with me to Romans chapter 15. The gospel is made up of an understanding of a number of key promises made by God to key people or fathers of Israel. Reading Romans 15 and verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Here we learn that the Lord Jesus Christ came to confirm these promises. He is the linchpin on which they all hang and in him they have and will have their fulfilment. Hence, they, they, they're being the basis of the gospel. The promises made unto the fathers, called in Ephesians 2 and at verse 12, covenants of promise. They're individually known as the Edenic, the Abrahamic, and the Davidic promises, so called because of where they were made. The first being the Edenic covenant promises life. And this was because Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, disobeyed God and in doing so introduced sin and death into the world. And the details of this are in Genesis chapter 3. The second being the Abrahamic covenant, which promises an inheritance. God commanded a man named Abraham and his family to leave his hometown to travel to a far country that he would show him. And God promised that Abraham and his descendants would inherit that land. And you can read from, about that in Genesis chapter 12. The third being the Davidic covenant, a promises in which God promised King David a son that would rule the world with everlasting glory and power. And you can read about that in 2 Samuel chapter 7. With an understanding of these key foundation covenants of promise, which form part of what is known as the first principles in understanding the message of the Bible and the gospel, we can begin to interpret this wonderful book, the, book, the Bible, and we can learn more of God and his expectations of us and plans for this world. By an understanding of the message of the Bible, by baptism into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by constantly trying to live our lives in accord with God's teaching, we can have a hope of escaping from Armageddon, a hope of receiving life eternal and a place in the kingdom of God and that the Lord Jesus Christ will set up. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, the world today is like a stage set for a great drama. The major actors being the nations such as Russia, France, Germany and the Commonwealth nations are ready to take their place, awaiting the moment when the time is opportune for them to take their final moves. In effect, the final act is about to begin. The current events in the world are fascinating to the Bible student who anticipates the rise of Russia and its involvement in the Middle East, its occupation of Syria and potentially Turkey prior to Armageddon. The Middle East today dominates the attention of the press and world leaders. There is an increasingly obvious division between the major players in that area, just as the Bible has prophesied there would be. Our present world is well prepared for the prophetic drama leading to Armageddon. The countdown has already commenced. If ever there was a time when we should be considering our personal relationship to these events, and with God, and with the Lord Jesus Christ, now is that time. Christ, in Revelation 16, declared concerning these days, Behold, I come as a thief. 
Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them, that is the nations, together in a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So we can see the close link between those events. When that moment comes, which the world is preparing for now, it will be too late for personal salvation. Today is the day of opportunity, the day of salvation. By seeking Christ in the way appointed, we will discover the means by which we can escape Armageddon. The way in Christ leads to a happier and more meaningful life now, as well as eternal life in the future. It frees us from the worrying problems of the present, lifts us from the evils that surround us, and provides us with objectivity in life. The Lord Jesus Christ taught in Matthew 6 and verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. The time is rapidly approaching when the world will no longer be able to ignore the claims of God recorded in the Bible. A crisis is developing in the earth that will affect every single person in it. This should really sharpen our focus on these things and make us realise just how important it is to act wisely and to seek God while he may be found, while he may be found before it is too late. Ladies and gentlemen, our personal salvation is inextricably bound up with Christ's second coming. The fulfilment of Bible prophecy in our day shows that his coming is near at hand, and therefore so is that great battle of Armageddon. We urge you, with what little time remains, to use it wisely. Seek out your salvation from the Bible, that you might escape Armageddon.